Welcome aboard. Please welcome to the stage Axios Pro Tech Policy reporter, Maria Curie. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. My name is Maria Curie and we are here to talk about AI regulation and the responsible growth of artificial intelligence. To follow along on social media, use the hashtag Axios Events. And without further ado, please help me in welcoming Senator Cory Booker. Here. Hello, everybody. I would think this is like a this crowd needs to get a little more hyped. I know. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, Senator, you are actually a huge fan of technology. You talk a lot about how, as mayor of New York, you use technology to empower communities. Can you highlight one or two civil rights opportunities of AI, and what does it mean to be vigilant of them, as you have called for? So. First of all, technology and waves of technology have put us in positions that we never know. I always talk about New York City having massive health problems, a crisis they didn't know how to solve. Committee and committee, committee tried to figure out how the hell we're going to solve this problem. And then suddenly something was called the automobile and nobody had to worry about horse shit anymore that was piling up all around the city. And what's exciting to be alive at this moment is there are problems that we might even think are intractable that AI could open up in an extraordinarily expansive way. Like how many credit worthy businesses are there? But we know VC dollars, for example, right now, aren't doing an efficient job in recognizing where the best investment opportunity and ideas are. So I've always hoped that, 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 that technology could have a massive democratizing force. We know that minority communities have a disproportionate impact on health problems and health crises. Uh, we know that a climate change uh, disproportionately affects minority communities. AI offers opportunities to have breakthroughs that we're not even thinking of right now that could begin to level the playing field. Now that said, we also know that technology can be a two-edged sword. It could actually cause harm. And we've already seen some studies, I was talking to some Stanford researchers today, that looking at AI's usage in the medical profession have often used the wrong kind of inputs to assess the severity of suffering. And therefore, white applicants or white patients were getting certain treatments prescribed that generally were not going to African Americans. And so that's what we have to be vigilant about. I will always be a person that is boldly optimistic and hopeful of the future and wants us to seize it and wants government not to do the kind of things that undermine technological innovation. When I came to the Senate 10 years ago, I couldn't believe how government wasn't moving at the speed of innovation. And I watched companies from 23andMe to some of the drone companies. In fact, the, uh, the FAA hadn't issued any kind of drone licenses. They were afraid of uh, problems. They didn't even create any sandboxes. The only drone licenses they were giving was to the movie industry. And I said to the head of the FAA, if you were around during the time of Orville and Wilbur Wright, we would have never gotten off the ground. And so I want us to be bold about this period, to seize the opportunities, but to understand uh, the dangers, especially for disadvantaged populations. You often say it can't be about us wi without us. Is Congress representative enough of America today to responsibly regulate on AI? And are lawmakers meeting with the right outside groups and people? So, I, I mean, this is just so you all understand. I, now this is sort of my 10 year anniversary in the Senate. And when I got to the United States Senate, I was stunned. It was the least diverse place I had ever worked. I just went onto the Judiciary Committee and looked into the Judiciary Committee, and every senator was white, and every staffer behind them was white. And I'm like, wait a minute, they're making decisions that are disproportionately impacting communities like the one I lived in, which was a black and brown community. And uh, I went to Chuck Schumer, I talked about this this morning, in fact, with him, and me and uh, Brian Schatz, and said, look, uh, uh, Senator Schumer, why don't you 
force every Democratic senator to just publish the, publish the diversity statistics of your staff. And he did it. He said he got some people that were not necessarily happy about it. But in the seven years that we've done that, the number of minorities and women hired on Democratic staffs have shot up. And the anecdotal stories I hear time and time again have shown that the diversity of staffs are helping to make better policy decisions. Uh, I just know uh, some stories about sickle cell anemia differently affects um, uh, uh, African Americans, disproportionately affects African Americans. Having black people on staffs talking to their principals about this has helped to move bills and legislation. And so what worries me about technology right now is I've already talked about the problem with uh, VC investment. I mean, blacks, uh, Latinos, women, way underinvested in, in, in terms of, of, of providing the same avenues to manifest their genius or the, the extraordinary breakthroughs of the company, way underinvested. But what frustrates me more is some of our biggest tech companies in America have a, in the low single digit percentages of minorities on their staffs. And so I know the power of having diversity around a table to call questions. I saw it when I was on the first on the Foreign Relations Committee, and you had, I think, 20, 21 men on that committee, and one woman, Jean Shaheen, and I'd be sitting at the table sometimes, and she would call a question about a global issue, not that there's that many women all around the globe, and she, that was a joke, people. This is a, this is a, I know you're going to laugh at Rounds' jokes. This is a very partisan crowd here. Um, um, uh, what do you call a guy like me that uh, doesn't have children that makes lots of dad jokes? <laughs> a faux pas. This crowd is brutal. <laughs> I mean, I'm a very funny guy, and they're just not laughing. Uh, um, but, but you see Gene Shaheen on that committee constantly calling questions that even uh, uh, conscious senators from both sides of the aisle weren't thinking of calling. So here we are in this AI world, and unless you have diverse ideas, diverse lived experience, uh, diverse people around the table, I do worry about uh, the representation of inclusive ideas. And I'll give you an example. Um, a, a, an AI company in America was red teaming, uh, uh, was sort of testing out a, a platform. And I was at this conference. There wasn't that much diversity at the conference. And when we walked in, me and my friends uh, who were of color, we just started asking the, the, the platform, like, what does a leader look like? Only got pictures of white men. Uh, what does a professor look like? <laughs> only got pictures of white men. And I was wondering, how did they get this far to be putting this out uh, to a conference without even red teaming or, 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 or looking at uh, 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 that obvious questions that you should ask? Is, is there bias with it baked in within this system? So these are important things for us to look at. And dear God, with the powerful impacts that uh, AI, transformative impact AI is gonna have, we as policymakers especially, should be asking questions about its impact upon a diverse nation. Will it help us to be better in a, in a multicultural democracy, or will it uh, serve to further exacerbate divisions and disadvantage? The Senate is working on an AI report that we are expecting by the end of March. Can we expect an equity or civil rights component in that? I, I'm, I'm excited and encouraged to see in, in the conversations that have been formed by the Gang of Four, one of whom you're going to have, that there has been uh, a, a real effort to include diverse voices, diverse input, and to talk openly about these issues. So I think there's going to be a framework released very soon, and the various committees are going to start working on it. And I think, I, I feel confident that, the, that these issues will be brought to the table, and I hope it be done in an inclusive manner, reflective of legislation that's already out there. I have a bill with some uh, partners in the Senate, the Algorithmic Accountability Act. Uh, there are other versions of that around the Senate, and I think a consciousness that this, these are important issues that should be included in legislation. On that bill, that's a transparency effort. And we know that in the past, social media companies um, have objected to it. They cite First Amendment and proprietary information concerns. Why is this going to be any different, and what's it going to take to get a Republican to co-sponsor it? Uh, um, well, I hope you'll ask rounds that question. <laughs> um, no, uh, look, I, I, have, I have, again, I don't think you're going to find a greater tech optimist than me in the United States Senate. That said, um, I have been frustrated that we've had this big movement on social media, which I rode 
to a great success. I mean, I was a very early adopter of, of social media, but there's been, it's very frustrating to me that we have seen now the toxic aspects of social media uh, to our culture, how our enemies are exploiting social media platforms to pit Americans against each other, to undermine our democracy. I could go on and on and on. It's effect on teenagers uh, um, uh, and more. And we have an obligation as senators to do something about that. And of course, uh, large corporations often are going to re resist reasonable regulation. But I think there's a movement of consciousness growing in our country that we need to regulate this space. We're seeing globally, uh, uh, Europe is a great example of people moving to have regulations in this space. So um, I, I'm confident that we're, that we're growing towards a point where we're going to see more regulation and, and light touch or common sense regulation. In this space, I do have some concerns. There hasn't been an AI a company or leader come before us that hasn't said, we want regulation. And I think that a lot of folks might want regulation until it affects them or their company in some way. And that's the balance we have to find. And it's one of the reasons why I support the National AI uh, Research Resource. Because what, what I really don't want to see happen is that you see this concentration of power and some of these models, to build them out, we're now talking trillions of dollars, uh, large amounts of money that make AI research difficult to do uh, in a de democratic way. And I think that uh, actually that makes me fearful that we're going to lose out on that, not just the diversity, but also getting the input of some of the brightest minds around the country that could help us think through these problems. And so things like NARA, which is a bipartisan bill, could help us to begin to source um, a more, in a more democratic fashion, the best ideas around AI and give its more people access uh, to these large computing models necessary uh, for us to have outcomes that benefit our society as a whole and aren't just by uh, uh, companies that, that are driven by uh, meeting shareholder value as opposed to uh, the broader ideals of what's best for humanity. Right, and that's the Create AI Act, which you helped introduce. What are the prospects of passing that and funding NARE? And can you describe any recent conversations you've had with appropriators? Um, so, look, everything right now uh, in a Congress that often doesn't get things done um, um, is, is really depending upon what I think is why Chuck Schumer and the Senate uh, with his Republican partners have really been thoughtful about this. Let's get Congress people together, senators together, let them learn together, build knowledge, let's do this in a collaborative fashion so that we can have outcomes. This is a bipartisan bill that gives me a lot of hope that it's going to be partly included. Now, obviously, as you said, with the sophistication of understanding the world in which I live, it's one thing to authorize NAIR, but it's another thing to fund it. And I'm still hopeful that given the national security implications of what we're talking about here, uh, understanding that there is a global race going on, um, that, that that's going to be one of the motivating factors that will actually get this kind of more democratic research uh, opportunities done and accomplished. So today we saw that a government shutdown was averted at least until next week. Um, <laughs> is this type of you know, congressional dysfunction going to hurt the US's ability to remain responsibly competitive on AI, especially as we see the EU race forward on regulation? I think we're heading towards a, uh, and this is, uh, again, me being a prisoner of hope. Um, this uh, period of extreme tribalism in our country it has got to come to an end. This, this last 20 years, lurching from crisis to crisis, of impasse to impasse, is hurting us. I just got back from Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, this weekend I'll be in uh, Jordan, uh, 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 Israel. The biggest enemy that America has globally uh, can be found within our country. And it's not Republicans or Democrats or what have you. The biggest enemy really is our inability to come together and realize that we have so much common cause and common ground. I think the politics of our country will change in the next five to 10 years. And I'm going to be a part of those folks that, that push for it. I was talking to a big Republican pollster 
who joked with me about, uh, I don't know if you heard this, I ran for president once. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, thank you. <laughs> um, the one person amongst the 150 here, <laughs> that was about the percent I finished with the support, actually. <laughs> um, um, but but uh, he was joking to me about this idea of my presidential run being about this theme of it's not us versus them, it's just us, that, that, that more and more Americans on both sides of the aisle are tired of the kind of brokenness and want us to come together. What excites me is that, that my generation, uh, um, X-Gen and, and millennials and Gen Z, and I have no idea what comes after that, um, uh, but we are generations that are far more digitally native. And in some ways, that orientation makes us much more excited, hopeful about what the possibilities are for humanity and what our country can do in seizing it and defining our future. AI can be a part of that. And I'm hoping our politics over the next five to 10 years, as we see a generational shift, no matter what com comes of the outcome of this presidential election, last baby boomer to be, to be president of the United States. Uh, Mitch McConnell stepped down, uh, 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 announced that he will be stepping down. He's a baby boomer that's gonna move aside now, I think, for younger generations of leadership. There is, I think, a new generation coming that is gonna understand from technology uh, to innovation, uh, um, to the frontiers of and healthcare, the sciences, um, all of these areas that there's so much more common ground than there are the kind of traditional tribalistic wars. And if it's not gonna happen, we've gotta make that happen. Because when I travel to planet Earth, what worries me more is when I hear how urgently other countries want the best of who we are, that we've gotta manifest not just in our politics, but in the way we have uh, for generations now, ushered in the future of humanity. Perfect note to end on. That's all the time we have. Thank you so much Thank for your you time, very Senator. Much. Thank you. Welcoming to the stage Axios publisher and View from the Top moderator, Nicholas Johnston. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I love Washington on a rainy night like tonight. We can get a bunch of people out uh, for an interesting conversation uh, about AI. I only in DC. Uh, I love it. Uh, I'm the publisher of Axios. Thanks so much for being here. If you're an Axios subscriber, thank you. If you're a subscriber to Ashley and Maria's awesome Tech Policy Pro newsletter, thank you. If you are not, you're doing it wrong. Uh, they're the best in the business um, on this topic in town right now. Um, and I'm also hugely grateful uh, to our partners who make everything we do at Axios possible. And so tonight, a huge special thanks uh, to IBM for helping us convene this conversation. And so I'm very excited to welcome to the stage uh, for a view from the top conversation, uh, Senior Vice President and Director of IBM's Research, uh, Dario Gill. And the best part about having a conversation with Dario is that he brings friends. Uh, today, his friend is Meta's Vice President and Deputy Chief Privacy Officer, Rob Sherman. Dario and Rob, welcome to Axios. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Thanks so much. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, so let's start. Um, Big picture, a big topic in AI now, I think, is this discussion about uh, closed source AI and open source AI. So let's take a step back and maybe uh, give us like a very high level view of like what is the pieces of that debate and why it's important. Um, well, you're right. I mean, it's been a, a source of a lot of dialogue on, on this topic. 
to some degree, has been narrowly framed around a subset of this open innovation ecosystem that has to be has to you know link to models themselves, and uh, and the debate was on whether like very capable foundation models um, should have the model weights you know sort of like some of the intrinsic properties inside the neural network broadly available to an outside community to understand them, modify them, evolve them, versus a closed system which would mean like I have the technology. Only I know how I've built it. You can only use it, but you cannot tinker, create, or evolve it. Right. right? So that's been the narrow discussion. Uh, one problem with that is that an open innovation ecosystem is absolutely existentially important right, to the right outcomes of, of AI and, and the AI industry. And there's a couple of things that I would highlight that are important for that. One is that a technology that is so important and profound have to have very diverse economic benefits. Meaning, it would be a terrible outcome if the AI revolution ends up in the hand of just three or four corporations rather than broadly diffused in terms of prosperity and institutional diversity. And two, that absent an open innovation ecosystem, it's actually very hard to build trusted and safe AI because what you need is a lot of smart people looking at it, seeing what the problem's at, and fixing it in a collaborative fashion, and we've learned that time and again in a broad range of fields. This, this hits on a little some of the, the, the concerns that Senator Booker had just on stage right now. And like, Rob, you're vigorously nodding uh, <laughs> right here, so I want to let you jump in for your take on it as well. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really important question, and you know, I've been at, the, at Meta for coming up 12 years now, and we've had an AI research lab for most of that time. And actually, you know, while we're talking a lot now over the past year in Washington about open source and closed source and the role of AI, I, I think what's important to know is like this is not a fundamentally new question, right? We've been open sourcing artificial intelligence technologies for a decade or more. That's a core part of the way AI has grown up, but more importantly, it's a core part of the way computing has grown up. So the technologies that we are using to interact with each other in a secure fashion on the internet every day are largely open source. Right. Like no one knows the internet itself or the technology that underlies it, right? Right. It's been shared. Yeah. And so I, th I think this is such an important piece. And so, I mean, I, I think Senator Booker talked about the value of, of AI and the promise and also the fact that it can be used for harm. I think actually open sourcing is one of the most important tools that we have to guard against some of those harms. I mean, I think, you know, Dario, you, you alluded to this. But really, as a community coming together to try to spot issues and solve them together collaboratively gives us a lot more power and ability to, to identify those problems. The other thing that I just want and to solve them, you know, to solve them much more rapidly than any one company could do. The other thing that I just want to call out that I think is also really important and just sort of, you know, why I am personally so passionate about this is I think that open sourcing has the promise to really democratize this technology in a way that there's no other mechanism to do. So when we think about, you know, we've, we've had a lot of discussion about Llama 2, which is the large language model that we've released, where it's really about um, it, where, you know, people have used it to, you know, enable educational treat, educational programs in Brazil or, or you know, give people access to job opportunities in Africa, that kind of stuff. But but the thing that I'm most excited about actually is, is open sourcing of translation technology. I think this is one of the, you know, big promises of, for example, technology to enable people to build assets and build programs for 200 languages around the world right. that otherwise wouldn't get that service. And giving that technology and putting it in the hands of developers everywhere in the world is, I think, a really powerful component. Yeah, so let's talk about a little bit, <clears throat> okay, so maybe setting the stage for the debate here, let's talk a little bit about how you, how you move that conversation forward. Both IBM and Meta are part of the AI Alliance launched recently last year. Tell us a little bit about like, what's behind that, what its goals are, and how it's being, how it's being used, I think, uh, for some of these debates. So look, um, in, in sort of in Recognizing the reality of how AI and, in fact, as Rob alluded to, in the, the world of computing has been built and, um, and where it needed to go, there was a huge number of institutions, universities, startup, um, nonprofits, science agencies, both in the United States and international, that did not see themselves reflected in some of the sort of catastrophistic debate that was associated sometimes with what AI. What gets the most traction maybe online about what's, right. how so we're all going to be murdered of, There was a lot of that, right. and then this aspect that, you know, given false analogies like this, like nuclear weapons, you know, and therefore, you know, we should put in a bunker and only have five people develop this and so on. And they didn't seem themselves recognized. And then, and then, like, we started having conversations about how do we actually engage in a proactive fashion and involving all of these institutions in shaping the future of AI. 
And that led to the idea of creating the AI Alliance. And at present, it has over 80 institutions, many of the world's you know, greatest universities, as I mentioned, you know, nonprofits. You have even you know, environments like the Cleveland Clinic and many others, right. and internationally around that, who actually defend a common principle, which is open innovation is vital for the present and the future of AI. And we have working groups within it that allow us to collaborate. One of the most popular one subgroups around that is actually around trust and safety and benchmarking of AI models. So contrary to some of the arguments that have been put forth, the opposite is happening in the sense of like this community cares deeply about building good AI and building AI that has a set of productive uses. And they want to participate in actually their students, their professors, and many other stakeholders to make it better. And that's what the AI Alliance enables it to happen. Right. Uh, so what I love about these kinds of events in DC is that when you hold an event on one of those topics, like everyone who shows up, like they really care about this event. They're in charge often of these kinds of topics or regulating it, or at least think they do. Um, so welcome <laughs> to either of the type of, of you. As you make the rounds here in town, and Rob, you're based here, like what are you hearing when you speak to members of the, on the Hill or folks in the administration about these topics? I mean, I, I think I would start actually with, with Senator Booker's comments about really seeing the promise of this technology it being really important, but also recognizing recognizing that you know, there's a responsibility that we all have to, um, it, to build it thoughtfully and in a way that optimizes for the benefits. I think one of the things that I think is, is a common thing that we've been hearing from folks around this city, but also in other, uh, other parts of the world where they're thinking about policymaking is, you know, we're not starting from scratch. Right? We're not sitting in a situation where there are no laws that govern the way that AI is working. So for example, the, the Biden administration uh, put out a policy statement last year talking about anti-discrimination law and the role that it, that it played and in AI and how the government already has authority to do that. So I think one of the things is we're not starting from scratch and we have to do the work to figure out how those existing laws apply. But then I think it's also equally important um, and this is something that I, that I hear you know, pretty much across the board in the conversation is there are new questions. I mean, we've started to talk about some of them now and we really have some urgency because unlike lots of other areas where we're making policy, we have some urgency to figure out actually tangible solutions right now because the technology is moving so quickly. And I think actually going back to Dario's point about the AI Alliance, one of the things that I think is powerful there is it's not just about you know, identifying the problems and talking about why they need to be solved, but actually deploying technical solutions that can actually help. So then what right is the advice you give to folks in the room? Like what should they take away from, like you two, two folks are on the technology side, most of these people are probably policy makers. Like what should they hear from the two of you today and take away? Look, uh, I, I think a framework of regulating AI that is based on use cases and high risk use cases and focusing on regulating that and not regulating the technology itself, right? right? So, so a framework of risk-adjusted regulatory on, is one element around that. To not create a licensing regime for AI, right? I think it would be a huge mistake to go and you say, only these players can create AI, right. right? And the rest cannot. And the companion to that is to foster this open innovation ecosystem that would have broad economic benefits and a safer sort of outcome to that. And in terms, you know, in the end, is like not shield people from like, um, you know, doing the wrong thing and have liability associated if you actually, you know, cross the line around that, but maintain those three principles. is like, you know, liability, yeah. but uh, open innovation, and then, you know, sort of this, this aspect of, you know, credibly engaging and not creating a licensing regime that would hinder innovation. Right? That's a good list. All right. Uh, we're about to get the hook here. If you're familiar with Accios, we like to end on one fun thing at AI events. They get to be one cool AI Thing. So, like, for each of you, like, tell me something cool and awesome that's coming. Adari, you want to, well, Rob bought toys, so he can talk about that. Make sure you took a look at that. Yeah, so if you, ha <laughs> if, if you haven't seen the demo, we have um, Quest 3, which is our VR headset, and um, MetaQuest, um, or, sorry, uh, Ray-Ban Meta smart glasses over there, so you can try those out. I mean, the thing that I'm most excited about is actually the convergence of those two, of smart glasses and mixed reality, so that we can actually have more enriched experiences in the physical places that we are and in the way that we interact. I think there's a lot of power in education and there's a lot of power in bringing people together with the communities and the cultures that they're, that they're experiencing through the com combination of that. I mean, literally what you told me before we got on here, you're wearing the glasses, you see a sign in Spanish, and you ask the glasses to tell you what it means in English, and it does. Yep. 
Absolutely. That exists now, and it's sitting right over there. All right, Dario beat that. All right, I'm going to be ge geeky and boring <laughs> on this, right? Uh, but, you know, one of the biggest problems that we have, for example, you know, it happens in government, it happens in a lot of institutions, it is a huge amount of legacy code that has been built over many decades, yeah. right? And very often that affects the performance, the service we can give to citizens, or the capability in the Department of Defense, and so on. So I think one of the most exciting things that I am seeing right now is the ability of teaching AI to not only write code, but to translate code, document to code, and evolve the old code. Stuff. So fix the old stuff so that we can actually increase capability, provide better services to citizens, and actually free up money that we can invest it back on core missions of the different agencies and in government. So I'm enormously excited about the implications that I can have, and that was science fiction, and now it's beginning to work. I love ending on these optimistic notes. Uh, Dario, Rob, thanks so much for being here. Thanks to IBM for making tonight happen. Stick around, we've got more conversations coming. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good stuff. Thank you. Welcoming to the stage, Axios Pro Tech Policy reporter, Ashley Gold. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you tonight. For our next speaker, we are going to be talking to someone helping forge AI policy at the administration level. Please join me in welcoming NTIA Administrator, Alan Davidson. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for uh, being here with us tonight. Got a good turnout. I think people are excited to talk about AI. What else? So Excellent. let's start with the basics. What is NTIA's role in AI policy in the Biden administration, and why has NTIA been tasked uh, with what you've been tasked with when it comes to AI? Excellent. Why, why your agency? Excellent. Well, first of all, thank you. It's great to be here. Last time I was here was um, early, like crack, oh, dark 30 in the morning for one of your morning things. Mm -hmm. And I think the vibe is better in the evening. And I'm sure it has nothing to do with free drinks or anything like that. Um, I, I, it's great to be here. And I will say, so right, why NTIA? What are we, why, why are we here and what are we doing? Uh, we're here in part because what we do, uh, NTIA, what we do is tech policy. Tech policy is what we do. Um, right now for us, that we're, we serve as the president's principal advisor on telecom and tech policy. Uh, Right now, for us, that means a, a big mission around connecting everybody in America with broadband, uh, managing the federal spectrum, uh, making the internet a better place, uh, building a better internet. And all of that falls into the rubric of how do we make sure that technology is working in service of people, in service of human progress. And there's no better example of that challenge today than the conversation we're having around artificial intelligence. And um, we've been given some big homework assignments uh, by the administration as it starts to tackle uh, 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 this question around how do we make sure we've got responsible AI innovation. We're doing work around open, the openness of uh, AI, as we were just talking about, around building more accountable and trustworthy AI systems. and. Um, just generally around the policy aspects of AI. Let's talk about uh, what you just mentioned. Um, NTIA is going to have a request for comment on open foundation models. So let's quickly go over what is that and why <laughs> is it important to create right. policy around. Right. And it's important, well, you heard some of it already. And the starting point for this administration is responsible AI innovation is going to make a huge difference in people's lives. We want responsible innovation. We know it's going to transform every part of our economy. We want, it, we want that innovation to happen here in America, here in the West. 
Um, we know we're only going to get that responsible innovation if we also deal with the very real risks that we face in these um, systems that are already being deployed today, not the future risks, but today, risks around privacy, security, safety, bias, right? Uh, this assignment around the question of openness of models is really important because if you want to make sure we're doing responsible AI innovation, there's a big question about the openness of these, especially the most important models. And the homework assignment we were asked to look at is, uh, what should our policy be around openness in this space? Um, I think there are a lot of folks who initially looked at this and thought, wow, making models open could, could create real safety risks. You know, do we, will we have proper guardrails? Um, are there concerns about how these models might be misused? I think there's a countervailing view, and you heard some of it earlier uh, just now, that it's really important to also think about competition, innovation. We want to make sure that the most important um, AI technologies aren't just kept in the hands of a few large companies. And so that is the balance we need to uh, work our way through in this. That's why this is so important. We need both safety and security and responsibility and also um, openness and competition, and that's we're, we're looking to figure out how we get both. And is the hope that that ultimately turns into policy the White House could roll out in another executive order or, or Congress could take a look at? I ask because I heard from a lot of more open source type AI companies that felt they were kind of left out by the AI executive order, that it really focused on the bigger, more closed system. So how should those smaller companies that focus on open foundation and open source be thinking about what you're doing now? Well, I think um, to start with, it's, this is, uh, there are a lot of tools in the toolkit in terms of what we ultimately do in this area. And, um, you know, the federal government, obviously there are issues that, you know, one could think about legislation, but that's actually quite hard to do. But there are a lot of other things. We've gotten, for example, a set of commitments from a dozen of the leading uh, companies in the space uh, to make sure that they've got a set of protections and guardrails in place. We have the power of the purse, our own procurement, uh, like what is the government going to buy? So there are a lot of different ways we can approach these issues and different tools that we can use. I think for the smaller companies who are looking at this, I think, I hope they take some heart in the fact that this executive order, uh, which I think is one of the most ambitious statements by any government on the planet about how to address the big issues around AI. That executive order did not, this executive order has not taken a stand yet on this particular issue. Mm -hmm. And I think for the smaller companies and those who believe in openness, I think hopefully it, it shows that we're going to take a real evidence-based approach. We're going to talk to people. We just put out a request for comment that's open to the public. Um, you know, operators are standing by. Please submit <laughs> your comments. Uh, and um, we're going to listen to what people have to say and think deeply before we make any choices here. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the challenges? I mean, government is obviously bureaucratic, slow. What the government has been able to do so far on AI is frankly impressive to me as someone who's watched the government for years. Right. Usually we're not moving this fast, but clearly it's not quite fast enough. We just saw the other day um, with uh, Google's image uh, AI generator had a, had a bunch of flops, as you might call them. So when these things are... <laughs> it's a technical term of art, right, yeah. <laughs> uh, when these things are sort of rolling out in real time, the public is using them, experimenting with them, right. and it's sort of this trial and error in real time, and the government can't exactly roll out a new rule tomorrow about it. Like, how do you deal with that? Um, with humility, hopefully, <laughs> um, in some ways. Here, we, we know this is an extremely dynamic area. And what's amazing about this moment is I do think that AI has captured everybody's imagination in a way that we haven't seen before, mm -hmm. right? Like you've been in this space, a lot of us have been in this space for a while. It is, it, there's, this is something It's usually a different. little more boring around here, honestly. Uh, I don't process. know about that, but this is really, like if you think about a, you know, a year and a half ago, you know, we had, most people hadn't heard about ChatGPT, right? And so there's this moment, right, where I think because of the accessibility of some of these tools, and, and I, you know, I'm not sure these are even the most important tools in the long run, mm -hmm. right, the, the large language models. It's captured people's imaginations. So we have to lean into that moment, and I think you're seeing government 
respond with a sense of urgency in a way that you rarely see in the tech space. Certainly that's been true for this administration. We got the commitments from companies this summer uh, and this fall, put out an executive order this fall that's massive, probably one of the biggest that anybody's ever seen in recent history. We're working on international commitments because we know that math doesn't stop at the border. We need to be working on this with our partners. And um, we're leaning in. And I think so. we have to always be, but I think we're always doing it with a sense that we want to promote innovation, responsible innovation. We don't want to stifle the market. We want that innovation to happen here, but it's got to happen responsibly. And that is what we're constantly now working towards. And I mean, you've been in this space for a long time. Uh, you formerly were at Google. I, I tend to think that... Uh, long time ago. Long time ago. Uh, uh, right. <laughs> you know, I think that companies have gotten a, a lot simpler more... simpler time, I should a say. A simpler time. Uh, I tend to think companies are a lot more responsive to Washington than they used to be. They're paying a lot more attention. There's a little more deference. Um, what are your observations of how the relationship between leading right. tech companies and government has changed over the years, especially now that we're in the AI era and sort of maybe move past the initial sort of tech clash over social media? I think it's a, it's a great question. I, I think your observation is exactly right, which is that um, the relationship between Washington and the tech community or Silicon Valley has really changed over time. And I think you're seeing, I mean, the, the conversations already this evening show how much more, how engaged com not just companies, but academics and civil society and nonprofits are in these big tech issues. I, was, I think about, um, I used to have this chart, like when did every, when did every company hire their first policy person, public policy my person? my kind of chart. Yeah, Love it. exactly. <laughs> um, and it, for Microsoft, it was like, I think it was like employee number 20,000, let's say. And for Google, it was probably around employee number 2,000. And for Twitter, it was probably around employee number 400. And if you look at OpenAI or Anthropic AI, you know, these are companies that are hiring in their first 100 or 150 employees, yeah. they've got to have a public policy person. And that is just one indication of the seriousness and we're seeing it. And what's amazing to me is, that's why this moment is so interesting, is everybody's leaning in. Companies are leaning in. Uh, public interest groups are stepping up, and now you see governments at the federal level, at the state level, everybody's thinking about what, how do we respond to this revolution. Absolutely, and let's talk about Congress for a second. Uh, we had Senator Booker up here, we're gonna have Senator Rounds. From your perspective, what would be the most useful thing for Congress to do legislatively on AI in the next year or two? Uh, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of possible answers to there. There's a lot of things that are potentially on the table. I think the most important thing is what Congress is doing right now, which is getting smart on the issue. And I've been really impressed with the level of um, uh, investment on both sides of the aisle uh, in these, these, these education and fact-finding sessions. And that's where we have to start. And then the next piece of it will be, there are, there's a menu of things that we could do supporting openness in the space, transparency rules, supporting computing infrastructure, making sure we have the tools to compete on this global stage. And I think that is a very good place for Congress to pay attention. There will be other things down the road about making sure we have those guardrails in place. The only other thing I'll say is there's a set of things that have been overdue on the congressional agenda in the tech space that would really help you don't in AI. Say. <laughs> like what? Well, like a comprehensive privacy uh, law, yeah, if you would. Um, so, you know, we always say this is the year it's going to happen. It would really, but I think the yeah. interesting thing is a lot of the concerns we have about data and privacy and safety and security and AI would be helped if we got a comprehensive national privacy law. Yeah, yeah. definitely As not the first person. My I've grandmother heard that would from. say, from your lips to God's ear. So would my um, grandmother. So. Amazing. Um, <laughs> I do think with that, we always like to end on a, a nice grandmaism. So we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up with that. Um, but thank you so much for chatting with us tonight, and um, yeah, appreciate you being here. We're looking forward to your your next rule make, no, no, your next comments and the AI accountability yes. initiative. I know is coming soon too. So we'll be looking Stay out. Stay tuned, and it's yeah. all about work making technology work for people. The fact that we're having this conversation that it's standing room only. That is, it shows the power of the moment and we need to lean into it and try to work together, uh, all of us, to make sure that this new technology is being developed responsibly and you know, in a way that serves human progress. So thank you, thanks for the conversation. Thanks so much, Administrator, I appreciate it.
We are going to close out uh, tonight's interviews with a leading voice in the Senate on AI policy. Please welcome to the stage South Dakota Senator Mike Rounds. Hey, how you doing? Good see you. Hey. Hi, Senator. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you for joining us tonight, and thank you for uh, closing us out. We saved the best for last. Uh, um, the votes take a priority. <laughs> yes, got to vote. Um, let's kick it off with some news from yesterday. Uh, there were reports that the bipartisan AI working group is going to issue some sort of report um, next month. Can you tell us a little more about that? During the time in which we had nine different uh, events where members of the Senate and their staffs were invited to come on in and listen to leading AI contributors from literally all over the United States and in some cases around the world, we were trying to provide at least a good background to everybody so that they could begin the process of talking on a committee by committee basis what they would be looking at in terms of legislation, incentives or guidelines to try to move it in the right direction. And uh, uh, what we've come up with is, is at least a profile of different ideas so that we can share that with committee chairs, committee ranking members, uh, members of the Senate who have an interest in it, to kind of lay out some ideas about what their different committees might want to take a look at, but kind of just a, a, a message, not so much telling everybody what to do, but what the different areas of interest might be, and perhaps some pathways down for consolidation of some for different committees. Just as an example, if you're looking at uh, how healthcare works, um, you know, the the Finance Committee might very well be an area where they're going to take a look at, at uh, uh, different approaches about how you pay for these innovations and so forth uh, through you know, Medicare and Medicaid and so forth. But that's the idea behind it is, is to kind of just lay out in very general guidelines what we learned, what some recommendations are, and some ideas for developing or uh, looking at different types of, of um, of legislation. And, and, and then once again, not telling them it's got to be done at a particular time or anything, but on a very bipartisan basis, what could we all agree on as a background for developing further legislation in the future? So should we think of that as sort of the first step uh, after these roundtables of legislative ideas? Might there be another report down the line with more ideas? Like, how did you decide what was important to include first? We wanted, we wanted number one, not to be laying out the perfect approach where this is the, this is the Bible and this is the way the Senate's going to do it, but rather to invite the committees to get active and, and invite the committees to compare what happens when you have this really super powerful new tool that will speed up the decision making um, and, and how it affects the areas in which they're responsible for either incentivizing development, uh, uh, you know, an, an economic development program, and, and also what the guidelines should be for the regulatory side. H how do you lay out the implementation? If you already are protecting um, intellectual properties and you have patents and you have copyrights, and now you have the, the, uh, the uh, um, addition of artificial intelligence that may very well train on copyrighted information. How do you make sure that that's accounted for? How do you make sure that the laws that are already in place are still, are, are still executable today? And at the same time, how do you allow for the development of some of the brightest ideas out there and then incorporate AI into its further development? And how do you make sure that you compensate individuals for the intellectual property that they own? So those are the types of things that we've talked about. But the background for all of this, and I really should have started with this. Look, it, 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 artificial intelligence is, as many of you probably know, it, it is an acceleration tool. It allows us to make appropriate decisions much more rapidly than a human ever could. It's not going away. It is here, and it is here to stay. Now, the question is, is our country, in terms of its national defense priorities, absolutely has to incorporate AI in our decision-making processes. The reason for that is because all of our adversaries are doing that today. We have to stay ahead of them. And the way that we stay ahead of them is to invite the best and the brightest and those who are most capable to do their research 
and to share their research with our Department of Defense, with our Intel community, but also to recognize the need so that others can have a free and open society, which is uh, you know, not necessarily the way a lot of the rest of the world operates. At the same time, we've got really good competitors out there. UAE is an example who wants to become a world leader in, in uh, artificial intelligence. So let's work with them uh, in, in doing so. Uh, the other side of this is that, that when it comes to the quality of life, I really think the American people have got to be shown and, and they've got to see for themselves that it's not just all scary stuff. It's all not just misinformation being put out by, uh, by, by bad actors, whether it be election misinformation or propaganda or misinformation about products that are out there or are, of misinformation about people. It's also the quality of life improvements that artificial intelligence can bring to this community. And healthcare, I think, is going to be one of the leading areas where we can, in a very short period of time, make major changes in the delivery of healthcare and the curing of some of the most critical and dangerous diseases that mankind has today. And have you sort of spoken to committees about legislative ideas that you have? Um, are there any specific committees you hope you know, start getting some bills out as soon as possible? Or do you think maybe it touches every committee? It, it, it really does touch every committee, but some committees more than others. I think the Finance Committee, I met, we started today uh, uh, Todd Young and I are talking to the Republicans or the, 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 uh, the, the, the uh, ranking members on the committees. Uh, Chuck Schumer um, uh, um, and Martin Heinrich on the Democrat side will probably be doing the same thing with the chairman. And then we'll try to bring them together in a bipartisan fashion. We, in the Senate, it takes 60 votes to do anything. We need to keep this bipartisan in nature. And, and we need to find those areas of consensus so that we build that confidence that we really are moving in the same direction when it comes to using this extremely valuable tool, but this valuable tool that could be used for bad purposes if, if we don't pay attention to it. So we, we're going to go committee by committee. We're going to visit with them. And, and, and our invitation is, is we've got some ideas, but we don't want to dictate what we want them to be able to do is to recognize what the impacts are to the, to the areas that they either regulate or promote. Mm -hmm. and, and if we can do that and provide them also with necessary tools such as great advice from multiple different experts in the field of AI, now they feel more comfortable in looking at what should be either regulated or what should be incentivized. And, and, and look, we're going to end up doing both, but I'm going to start with this. If something that goes on is an activity that we consider to be illegal today, simply including a rapid decision-making process such as artificial intelligence doesn't change whether it's right or wrong. If it was wrong before, it's still wrong today. And so we have to be able to incorporate that into the, into the way that they lay out the guidelines for the regulatory aspects. But the other piece of this is that these really bright people can really go any place in the world and do their research to continue to build AI at as rapid a pace as possible. So if we chase them off by a regulatory environment that says, we're really going to slow you down, and we're going to make it more difficult for you to do this, they simply hop the next plane, and they take their intelligence with them, and a lot of the data and capabilities go with them as well. So we want to incentivize them to be here, um, but at the same time, the vast majority of them have told us regulatory activity is okay as long as it's a light touch and you're doing it to promote the continued development of AI in a safe environment. And, and so we want to do both. And you talked about areas of consensus and keeping it bipartisan. Has anything emerged so far that you really think is bipartisan and, and people are starting to agree and you especially noticed after your roundtables perhaps any specific subject areas? Surprisingly, perhaps, and maybe I'm biased on this, I serve on the Armed Services Committee. Uh, I'm, I'm ranking on the Cyber Subcommittee. And I also serve on the Intelligence Committee. And I think the one thing that caught my attention was the understanding across the board that we had to be as good or better than anybody else in the world. And the reason for that was because in the defense of our own country, um, we can leave nothing to chance. AI will be a part of our national defense, and there, it's a race, but it is a race with no end game. 
it is a continuous improvement that has to be adopted by our country. And in doing so, we keep people safe. Um, if we don't, and if our adversaries see this powerful tool as something that they can gain an advantage on the sun, then pretty soon they begin to dictate the terms of what a peaceful world might look like or what a really ugly world might look like in the future. And so that's number one. I, and we found that consistently across the board with all of the experts. The other piece was that, that when it comes to uh, the, the ability to compute at a really rapid pace, that's not going to end. But we have to do whatever we can to slow down some of the most advanced computing capabilities when it comes to allowing it to leave our country. And it's not that we're going to be able to keep these advancing systems away from some of our adversaries for a long period of time, but every month that we can delay their capabilities from growing with ours gives us one more leg up in keeping our country and our allies safe. Um, and can you sort of talk about what sort of companies you might be referring to? Or is it the companies that are working on the most advanced models? And what is sort of keeping them in check look like at this point? Yeah, yeah look, the, in, order to, in order to advance AI, you've got to have a couple things happen. And num number one, you've got to have the ability to compute at, at an exceptional rate. And, and the chips, so we're talking about the chip makers. But we're also talking about the folks that actually write the original uh, algorithms and who can then teach the fastest of the machines to actually create their own algorithms. And then to network. And that's one thing that we are really, really good about is being able to network and to combine and to access multiple systems at one time. We're as good as anybody in the world at it. We have to keep that. And the other piece on this are, you know, if it's, it still comes back to the old adage of, you know, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't have good databases, if you don't have labeled databases to learn from to begin with, um, then you're going to have some really bad information out there. And if you don't have really good databases, just as an example, I mean, people are really concerned about whether or not you have biases built into your systems when it comes to, to, to um, items concerning day-to-day -day operations, making a loan, buying a house, and so forth. But, but I, I would challenge you to begin with, we make decisions today about who should be able to buy a house and who should be able to get a loan. A lot of that is made by a human being. There is no human being out there that has no bias. So we start from a position of can we make it better using AI? And can we, as we learn better ways to do that, to incorporate the better algorithms into it, do we have a system that actually allows us to make those improvements so that people have confidence that we're trying our best to eliminate as many of those biases as we possibly can? So that's an, another piece of this. Those, those abilities to take multiple databases and to bring them together that allows for some of the fastest systems in the world to actually develop more quickly and to do a better job. When we say we're going to combine all these, these, these bases, these databases, there's one thing that should raise a red flag for everybody, and that is, is, well, what about personal privacy? And part of what we've got to be able to do, and I'm going to come back to the healthcare stuff. I want to make sure that we do everything we can to do as much in terms of the quality of life for individuals that live in this country as we possibly can, and for mankind around the world, quite frankly. But in order to do that, you also have to respect the privacy of the individuals. So we have to create databases, combine databases, but do it in such a fashion that we still protect the privacy of individuals whose information is found in those databases. So just kind of a, we've got a lot of stuff to do. Yeah, I think you and Administrator Davidson agree on, on privacy and the need for that. And we only have a little bit left, so I'm going to ask you real quick, um, will we see any AI bills on the floor before the election? You, 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 may, you may very well, but they will take different forms and they will be attached to different types of products that are moving through. The National Defense Authorization Act has some already in it. You will see more in the, in the NDAA this year. I think if you see uh, improvements in, in, you may very well see some things in any type of, a, uh, of an appropriations bill. There may be some. But in terms of each individual, uh, um, um, each individual uh, committee, they're going to have to kind of work through their own items and identify mm -hmm. the most important items. Privacy and also transparency for the upcoming election is an area where 
we might very well see some items to improve or to improve our capabilities to identify for the public what is misinformation because you're going to have to use AI to identify an AI created misinformation program. <laughs> and on that note, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, thank you so much, Senator Rounds, for joining us, and we look forward to seeing us, seeing what else you guys do up on the hill on thank AI. You. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.